Hey everyone, this is Nick, it's the weekend, the world is a wonderful place and nothing weird happened, so it's time to obliviously dive into the Linux and open source news. In this one, we have an unfortunate delay for the release of Fedora 37, due to a yet undisclosed vulnerability inside of OpenSSL. We have a grand plan being laid out to make booting Linux safer and more robust, and we have a big, big release of VKD3D that should improve gaming performance on Linux across the board. So let's take a look right after I tell you everything about today's sponsor. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games. For example, Focal Board. If you don't know about it, it's an open source alternative to tools like Trello, Asana, or Notion. It lets you create milestones, keep track of your nodes, have a bird's eye view of your projects, and it basically helps you get stuff done. And you can deploy your focal board server in one click from your Linode dashboard, something I should probably do to ensure that I keep delivering my videos on time. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. Looks like, unfortunately, Fedora 37 is going to be delayed. And not just by a little. The reason is an update to OpenSSL, which will be released early next week and fixes a critical bug, which we don't know the details for, I guess because it's a really big vulnerability that shouldn't be divulged early to avoid security risks. Fedora can't try integrating the fix early either, because it would mean revealing the issue publicly, as all their development pipeline is open. The option was to release Fedora 37 anyway and add the fix later, or to wait for the open SSL fix, integrate it, and release 37 after. They went for the second option, probably to avoid shipping an ISO with a big security flaw in it that would be known immediately, and also probably to make sure they have ample time to test the new version of OpenSSL, which is very critical on a lot of users' systems. Now, the initial release date for Fedora 37 was on November the 8th, and obviously they wouldn't have had enough time to properly test things and still be able to confidently greenlight the release. The delay might not be worth it in the end, depending on how severe the OpenSSL vulnerability is and how easy it is to update the package in Fedora, but they decided to err on the side of caution. I pretty much agree with them on this one. If you don't know the exact impact of a specific vulnerability, it's always better to push the deadline than to risk shipping something that is either broken or really insecure. Now, a few things are going to change for the Linux kernel. First, support for i486 might just be dropped soon. This architecture created in 1989 is a predecessor to the current architecture used by Intel and AMD CPUs, and it's still completely supported in the Linux kernel, even though no new device have used such a CPU in a while, and the ones that still have one are probably on their way to the grave. Linus Torvalds said that this hardware class isn't relevant anymore in terms of kernel development, and that they are museum pieces that might as well run museum kernels. The discussion is still open, but it's undeniable that removing support might lighten the kernel and make maintaining it a bit easier. On top of that, the Linux kernel 5.19 is now end of life, which means that you should either upgrade your distro to move to a newer version, or upgrade the kernel in place, because it won't receive any security fixes or maintenance. Ubuntu 22.10 released with a 5.19 kernel, and I hope they have a transition to version 6 planned, because while there are no immediate risks, it will not be the case for long. As a rule of thumb for kernels, it's always better to be either willing to upgrade your kernel every time there's a new major release, or to stick to the LTS versions to make sure you always have something that has support. And still on the Linux kernel, it looks like the developers are going to take a closer look at Secure Boot and the whole boot process for Linux systems. As of today, there are a few issues. The root file system encryption is unlocked at startup, but isn't protected and trivial to attack. 
Updates to the bootloader aren't all that robust with multiple files needed and regeneration of boot scripts. There is no rollback protection and you can't really revoke secrets for older OS versions, which means an attacker can access them if they get access to the old OS, which is easier because it's not updated anymore. The new proposed design would have a fully signed process from the firmware to all the user space components. It would add rollback protection, simplify updates with one file per concept for the bootloader. It would make proving the validity of the OS easier, even remotely. It would secure disk encryption and it would build around TPM2, which is basically the standard on all new computers, all while supporting TPM-less systems, of course. Basically, if all of this seems like incomprehensible mumbo jumbo to you, the goal is to make booting a Linux-based OS a lot safer, a lot sturdier, and a lot less susceptible to attacks. The blog post has a lot more technical details, and while I won't lie and say that I understood every single part of it, it does look like a very robust and thought out boot process that should make our systems a lot safer. And maybe the new GNOME device security panel will finally reach a security level higher than zero. Google Summer of Code ended, and KDE has received a bunch of interesting things thanks to that program. NeoChat, the Matrix client, will get support for spaces, a way to organize rooms and discover new ones. Discover will get permission management for Flatpak and Snap applications, with a list of permissions for each app and the ability to enable or disable them. So basically like flat seal for GNOME, but baked into Discover. Digicam got a new plugin to process OCR and recognize text, and the image quality sorting filter has also received improvements, taking into consideration noise, exposure, compression, and more. Krita will get pixel-perfect ellipses once the work that's been started is completed, and Krita images will also be able to be exported as SVG, again, once the code is completed. Google Summer of Code is always a nice way for new contributors to get started on open source. We as users get new cool features, they get some development time under their belt and some development experience, and open source projects get more contributors. It's a win-win. And on a side note about KDE, KDE Neon has been rebased on Ubuntu 22.04, which means you will get an in-place upgrade for the internals and the repos will have access to newer software, while the KDE Plasma desktop will keep being updated to each new version on a rolling release model. One notable difference with Ubuntu is that the Firefox browser is packaged as a deb and not as a snap. And Neon is my favorite KDE distribution. It's very stable with the LTS base, but you always get the latest apps, the latest KDE libs, and the latest Plasma desktop all the time. You don't have to wait for a major upgrade like on Kubuntu to get the new goodness, which I think is a great model. Zorin OS 16.2 was released. While it's only a point release, these generally are pretty feature-packed for Zorin, and this one definitely is. While the GNOME version hasn't changed compared to the original release of Zorin 16, stuck on GNOME 3.38 with a bunch of customization on top, Zorin users will get a much improved Windows installation process. You can now just click on Windows App Support in the menu to install all you need, and they have expanded the database they use to list installers for popular Windows apps and games. And they will also redirect users trying to install some clients towards open source apps that work better, like the Heroic Games Launcher instead of installing the Epic Games Launcher with Wine. They also added alternatives to various Microsoft fonts that are metric compatible, which means they won't break the layout of your documents between Office suites, and you don't have to install fonts who have proprietary licenses. 16.2 also updates LibreOffice to 7.4, as well as most pre-installed applications. And Zorin Connect, which is their KDE Connect rebrand, now has support for the computer's battery status displayed on the phone. The jelly effects, also called wobbly windows, now also are applied to the maximize animation, and they updated the kernel to follow the one in Ubuntu 22.04 with hardware enablement. Zorin OS definitely is not for people who like to have the most recent stuff, as their super old GNOME version demonstrates. But for beginners and people who want a nice looking and polished interface, it's one of my favorite options in terms of new Linux user distro. Now, we also have some nice new Linux hardware coming our way. First, System76 refreshed their Thelio lineup, 
which already had a design refresh with new removable side panels in multiple colors a few weeks ago now. And now these desktops are available with the latest AMD 7000 series or Intel's 13th gen CPUs. They also have a Halloween promotional sale so you can save a buck or two on their nice devices, at least if you live in the North Americas as they don't ship their desktops to Europe or the rest of the world yet. Which <sighs> kinda pisses me off. Come on System76, I want to review those devices, they look extremely cool. Just set up your distribution center in Europe, damn it! And we also have a new laptop from Tuxedo, the Infinity Book Pro 16, which is the same chassis as the Slimbook Executive 16 I reviewed recently. I will leave a helpful link in the description and a card up top so you can check it out. Tuxedo does offer more options though, as you can get it with either an RTX 3050 Ti, a 3060, or a 3070 Ti, and you can choose a display that is 90 Hz or 240 Hz. These laptops are using Intel's 12th gen CPUs and support Thunderbolt 4 and USB-C charging. I absolutely loved the Executive 16, and I would expect Tuxedo's take on the same chassis to be just as good. The form factor is simply perfect because it takes the same size as a 15 inch 16x10 laptop but it has a 16 inch screen inside. It's just amazing. And let's finish this video with the gaming news. First, we have a new huge release of VKD3D Proton version 2.7. This one is massive, collecting changes that have been worked on since March, and it requires pretty recent drivers, Mesa 22 or the Nvidia proprietary drivers version 5.10 and upwards. In terms of improvements, the pipeline cache has been improved a lot, being enabled for all games now, and this should lead to better performance. DirectX 12 mesh shaders are now supported, GPU performance has also been improved, and there is preliminary HDR support as well. And it also fixes a bunch of game-specific bugs. It's not officially in Proton just yet, and the Proton 7 line will stick to the older version of VKD3D, but you can always install this one manually, or just wait for new Proton release to get it automatically. It also looks like we're going to be taking a few steps back in game support, as Electronic Arts is phasing out Origin for their EA app, which isn't very well supported on Linux with Proton. Multiple titles on Steam had their Origin launcher replaced with the newer EA one, and this seems to break quite a few games on Linux, with the gaming on Linux website having issues with Titanfall 2 and Jedi Fallen Order, both exhibiting the same issues with difficulties to log in or to even get to the game. Game publishers really just need to stop adding their own launchers on games that are bought on other platforms. If I wanted to use the EA launcher to launch my game, I would have bought the game on EA Store, not on Steam. If I use Steam, I don't want you to display an additional launcher while I also have to log in just to play the game I bought on another platform. Stop it! What is not stopping though is this segue to today's sponsor. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany and they make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box. And the main advantage of this compared to buying any old Windows laptop and trying to install Linux on it is that it removes the guesswork. You know that the hardware is Linux compatible, you can pick from a selection of very popular distros or you can install your own and rest easily knowing that stuff is supported and is going to run. They also have a wide range of devices that should suit every price point and every need, from small ultrabooks and knocks to gaming workstations, gaming laptops and everything in between, you have choices. And for each device you also have choices. For the RAM, the CPU, the GPU, the SSD, you can have your own logo engraved on the back. For laptops you can have your own custom keyboard layout. It's just very, very customizable. So if you need a new device and you don't want all the hassle of looking up online, finding a compatible device based on a few old forum posts, just click the link in the description below and buy your new Linux device from Tuxedo. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to help me make more of these videos, you can click the super thanks button underneath the video, you can click the PayPal link in the description, or you can click the Patreon or YouTube membership links. 
Both of these get access to a weekly podcast every Monday where I talk about Linux, open source, my personal life, the channel, everything basically. And you also get to vote on the next topic that I'll cover for the month that comes after. So if you're interested, all the links are down there. And in the meantime, thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.